She wore a scarf in our first interview because she did not want you to know her. She was a humble 21-year-old from a poor farm family. Her dream was to own a hair salon in her village of nearly 2,000, but that was before the massacre. She didn't want to be on 60 Minutes, but she needed the world to know what ISIS did, the murder, the rape, the genocide of her people. Nearly six years ago in Iraq, we discovered this hesitant, frightened woman. We did not imagine that her scarf concealed not only her identity, but also a fierce invincibility, which would lead her four years after our interview to the highest honor the world has to give. We found her here, among refugees who survived the invasion of the ISIS terrorist army. Her people are Yazidis, a minority in northern Iraq that is poor, persecuted, and bound by faith to its revered Mount Sinjar. In 2014, ISIS invaded. Two months later, we came to report on the atrocities of the self-described Islamic State. Of course, no country on earth recognizes that state, but if it had a border, this would be it. Beyond that border was the Yazidi homeland, where the faithful practice a religion that predates Islam by 3,000 years. In ISIS's perversion of the Muslim faith, the Yazidis were non-believers, condemned to slavery and death. On Friday, August 15th, at 11.30 a.m., they entered our village and told us all to come to the school. There, the women and kids were put upstairs and the men downstairs. What happened to you at that point? As we were entering the school, I was with one of my brothers. There, we saw a bulldozer, and I asked my brother, why is there a bulldozer here? He replied, to throw dirt on the bodies when they're done killing. Her brother was right. The Yazidis, about half a million, were defenseless civilians. Thousands of men and elder women were executed. Boys, age seven and older, were forced into the ISIS army. What happened next? They started loading up 150 girls in four dump trucks. More than 3,000 women and girls as young as nine were trucked into slavery. She says she was sold and raped, sold and raped again, and then gang raped after a failed escape. What about the other members of your family? <laughs> I have no idea where my brothers are. I want them all to return, but most of all, I just want my mother. <laughs> Tell them, I just want my mother. She seemed broken. But as our interview went on, her confidence grew, as though she came to realize she wasn't speaking for herself, she was speaking for her people. Months later, she settled in Germany, joined a human rights group, and campaigned for justice. In 2018, the world learned her name because Nadia Murad was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The 2018 Peace Prize was meant to expose atrocities women suffer in war. The honor was shared with Dennis Mukwege, whose hospital treats the sexually assaulted in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm curious why you chose to speak with us five years ago. At the beginning, rape was a big shame for me and for others to speak about, because it would have remained a shame on you, on your family, and on your people. The biggest incentive that made me talk was those left behind, including my mother and sisters. I knew what was happening to those in the captivity of ISIS. Nadia Murad was captive nine days when the last man who bought her left a door unlocked. Kind-hearted strangers smuggled her across the Islamic State line. She became a UN human rights ambassador, began learning English, wrote a memoir, and vowed to see ISIS in court. But for that, she needed a lawyer. 
I met Nadia after a colleague called me and said, I have a new case for you. And I said, no thanks, I'm busy. And he said, there's just an extraordinary young woman I want you to meet, give me an hour. It didn't take an hour for leading human rights attorney Amal Clooney to take the case. I saw it as a test of the international system. It was so egregious because it involved ISIS, it involved a clear case of genocide, it involved sexual slavery to, at a scale that we haven't seen in modern times. And I thought, if the UN can't act in this case, then what does the international rule of law even mean? By 2015, not one free Yazidi remained in their homeland. This wasn't just war. By international law, the executions, rape, and kidnapping were war crimes. This was the same dilemma um, that the world had after um, the atrocities of Nazi Germany. And it's the US under President Truman and President Roosevelt that said, no, we have to have trials because there must be a judicial record of the atrocities committed by the Nazis. Because today you do have people denying that there were gas chambers. And, and what do you have to point to? You can go back and say, well, there are 4,000 documents that were submitted as exhibits in the Nuremberg trials. And the Yazidis deserve nothing less than that. They and there might be similar stacks of evidence of the crimes against the Yazidis, but Clooney feared securing it was a race against time. You, know, you had mass graves that weren't secured, where the Yazidis knew their relatives were buried and nobody was exhuming them. And also, I noticed that witnesses were becoming more and more reluctant to speak out as time went by. So, you know, there was only so much we could do as a small team of lawyers. And we said, this is the responsibility of the UN, and it's the responsibility of the most powerful body within the UN, which is the Security Council. Had you ever heard of the UN Security Council? Never. In 2015, just a year after we met her, Nadia Murad asked the Security Council to hold ISIS accountable. I've seen what they've done to boys and girls. All those who commit the crime of trafficking and genocide need to be brought to justice. The Security Council voted to approve a first step. In 2017, it created an investigative team to collect evidence of ISIS's crimes in Iraq. The team began exhuming some of the 202 mass graves that are known. Now the question is whether the evidence will ever be heard. Iraqi courts are convicting thousands of ISIS suspects of terrorism, but none has been tried for the crime of genocide against the Yazidis. Small pockets of ISIS fighters remain in Syria and Iraq, but U.S. and Iraqi troops have shattered ISIS as a cohesive military force. Is that justice? Absolutely not. You know, if you speak to Yazidi wit witnesses, victims, survivors, they will say, it doesn't help me if somebody's killed in a drone strike. In terms of justice, that means something very different. That means being able to be in a courtroom and look their abusers in the eye and tell the world what happened, what ISIS did to them. And that is, hasn't happened yet. It has happened before in other atrocities. Last year, a UN-backed court in Cambodia convicted two former officials of genocide 40 years after the Khmer Rouge murdered 1.7 million. Beginning in the 1990s, UN war crime trials were held for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. But Iraq is not a member of the International Criminal Court and has not agreed to war crime trials of its own. What we would like to see is an openness by the Iraqis to actually have international judges be involved in these trials, potentially international prosecutors. There are different ways of designing it. You know, the Iraqi government could enter into a treaty with the UN, or there could be an international court, and the Iraqis could agree to transfer those responsible for international crimes to that court. Today, peace, if not justice, has settled into the folds of Mount Sinjar. Four days after accepting the Nobel, Nadia Murad returned with the Yazidi man she would soon marry and two replicas of her peace prize. This is what the absence of justice looks like. The demands of the desperate focused on a woman abducted at 21 and now returning bearing the weight of a seven ounce medal. 
The morning that I won the Nobel Prize, I asked my husband Abid to see if there was a way I could decline because the prize would make my life difficult. But fate and God sometimes bring you something so that you can stop crimes and help others. Has the Nobel Prize changed your hopes for the future? Now, people look at me like I can rebuild Sinjar, that I can bring more help for the victims, and that I can take care of the orphans. But without support, this is not going to happen by just having a Nobel. In her village, she said, I have left a Nobel Prize at the Iraqi parliament, I hope Iraq, after 4,000 years, will recognize Yazidis. We have always been second-class citizens. <laughs> Later, she walked to a site that held the answer to the desperate question she asked in our first interview. The long green depression in the earth was a mass grave, her mother's grave. She said, Dear mother, my poor mother. You left a replica of your Nobel Peace Prize at your mother's grave. Yeah. What do you think she would have thought of that? I wonder if she knows that I have talked to the world about her silent death, the killing of her six sons and her two nieces. I often feel that what I have been doing is because of her. I wish that she would know about it. She may be happy because the world now knows what ISIS has done. This is the school where Nadia Murad was separated from her family. Five years later, the murdered and missing are present, but unaccounted for. Altogether, Nadia, how many members of your family were murdered? We were 48 brothers, mothers, sisters, nephews, and nieces in our family. Nine were killed and three are missing. The rest who were rescued now live in refugee camps. There isn't much for refugees to return to. Yazidi homes were wrecked or looted of everything but memories. Today, Nadia Murad is navigating without a chart, steering by the constellation of her people's dreams. An accidental leader, facing questions she cannot answer. Will they have homes? Will there be justice? It's estimated as many as 5,000 Yazidis were murdered, 6,000 abducted, nearly 4,000 are missing still. With no international trials scheduled for these crimes, evidence from mass graves is being entombed in Baghdad where it will wait until the world that hears her voice shares her courage. Whatever your view of the U.S. decision to end America's longest war and withdraw troops from Afghanistan, that country's fall to the Taliban in August of 2021 has unquestionably plunged that nation once again into a deep crisis. Millions are facing famine, and the economy is in shambles. Those suffering the most are Afghan women and girls. The Taliban has closed girls' schools beyond sixth grade and barred women from universities. That means that girls are banned from anything beyond a grade school education. Tonight, though, we're going to tell you a story of hope about a group of Afghan girls who are in school. As we first reported in February, they're at a school called Sola, the Afghan word for peace, and also short for School of Leadership Afghanistan. It was started by a young Afghan woman named Shabana Basish Rasuk who knows firsthand the power of an education. And though they had to flee Afghanistan in a harrowing escape, we found the girls of Sola back in the classroom, half a world away. 
These are the busy streets of Kigali, Rwanda, a landlocked African nation that was once the site of a horrific genocide that killed nearly a million and left two million refugees. Rwanda is now at peace and has become an unlikely place of refuge for almost two years to the girls of Sola. And they seem to be settling in. Are you ready for this? Yes. The evening we arrived at Sola's temporary campus here, the sixth and seventh grades were holding a geography competition. Spelling counts. Okay. Classes here are taught in English. Go. The girls were racing to identify nearly 200 countries all around the globe. They're wearing masks not to protect against COVID, but to hide their identities to protect their families still in Afghanistan. My name is Ahra. Zara's family has left the country so she can show her face. Saraya's and Najia's are still there. You knew every country in the world. Yes. You like it? it was, yeah. You like contests? Yes. <laughs> they're so passionate, they're so active, they're so eager, they're so interested. Shabana Basij Rasuk is Sola's founder and single-minded leader. How are you all doing? Great. At 32 and just over five feet tall, Shabana started creating Sola when she was still a student herself. Her story and her commitment to educating girls goes back to 1996, when Afghanistan fell to the Taliban the first time. She was six years old, and all girls' schools were closed. But Shabana's parents, a former general and an educator, refused to keep their daughters locked up at home. They heard about a secret school run out of a former principal's living room and saw an opportunity, despite the danger, for Shabana and her older sister to be educated. The Taliban did not allow women to go outside alone, so my parents dressed me up as a boy so that I could accompany my sister to and from that secret school. That was Whoa. the best way that both of us could receive an education. Oh my God, so they dressed you as a boy. My mom um, cut, cut my hair. I wore boys' clothes, pants, you know, pants and T-shirt and, yeah, bus cut. And the family carefully mapped out their roots. You know, you take different streets every day so that you don't create a routine. The same shopkeeper at a certain uh, convenience store should not notice you every day. So you were always afraid or they were always afraid you'd get caught. They never knew when or if we would return home. But even after a close call where Shabana and her sister were followed and begged their parents to stop sending them to school, her mom and dad said no. They told us things like, you could be forced to leave your home. You could be forced to become a refugee. You could lose any material possessions that you have. But the one thing that can never be taken away from you is your education. When the Taliban fell after the U.S. invasion in 2001, Shabana went to a real school for the first time, and she excelled, winning a place in a State Department program to spend a year of high school in the U.S. I was randomly placed uh, with this lovely host family in uh, Wisconsin, uh, where I gained 40 pounds. <laughs> but that wasn't the only way the year changed her. What struck me the most was living in a society um, for the first time in my life where girls had no concerns whatsoever that their freedom to attend school could be taken away from them anytime, which is something that every single Afghan girl who's lucky enough to go to school lives with. And you can't blame them, can you? No, I can't because Afghanistan is the only country in the world that won't let girls go to school. Yeah. So, um, why are you tearing up? Um, that Afghanistan's the only country? Mm -hmm. Shabana's commitment to her homeland runs deep. When she got a scholarship to attend Middlebury College in Vermont, she started working not on building a great life for herself in the U.S., but what she could do for Afghanistan. Her answer? Start a school. And by the time she graduated in 2011, 
an early version of Solo was already up and running in Kabul. I heard that it's different. Uh, it's a leadership program. Fatima was an early Sola student. You were encouraged to speak up? Yes. You like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. I, I thought, like, it's, it's such an awesome school. Fatima's two younger sisters, Aideen and Sajia, took notice. Sajia got in next. And I was like, well, next year it's my turn. <laughs> Ideen remembers trying to impress Shabana, the school's founder, in her interview. I was like reading a lot of books and I was writing their summaries down. And I was like, you know what? I should take this and show her. Like, I'm, I'm a smart kid. You should accept me here. <laughs> it worked. Ideen started as a sixth grader in 2016, the year Sola expanded to become a full-fledged 6th to 12th grade girls' boarding school, the only one in Afghanistan funded as a U.S. nonprofit through grants and donations. There were daily assemblies and the school's own special Pledge of Allegiance. We all are Afghans. We love Afghanistan. We will try our best and work hard to improve this beautiful country. Shabana's goal was both to educate her students and serve the nation by training a generation of leaders from Afghanistan's various regions and religious sects. My roommate was Shia and I was Sunni and it was my first time to talk to a Shia girl and it was so interesting to hear from her. Do you deliberately want the children of conservative families? We certainly uh, create an environment in which even the most conservative families in Afghanistan would feel comfortable sending their daughters. Do they? They do. Do you teach the Quran? We do. For these young women to be effective leaders of Afghanistan, they have to be great Muslims, great Afghans, and highly educated. At the start of 2021, Sola was thriving. Shabana had secured land in Kabul, and construction was underway on a new campus. There were a record number of applications, with students enrolled from all over the country, and Sola graduates were doing just what Shabana had envisioned. Fatima had finished college and was working at the Afghan Ministry of Finance. I was a professional woman. I was contributing. I also had all my friends who were educated women and men as well. So there was a little community. Yes. But the Trump administration had been negotiating with a newly emboldened Taliban, promising a withdrawal of U.S. troops. And then, in April of 2021, President Biden announced an unconditional exit. I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. I knew then that it was a matter of time before it was going to be irresponsible of me to run an all-girls boarding school in Kabul. She came up with the idea of taking the whole Sola community, students and staff, abroad for a semester while the American withdrawal played out. So she started searching for a country, ideally one nearby, that would accept them. But the warmest response she got by far was from Rwanda, and she grabbed it. You were going to go to a place called Rwanda. Rwanda. Did you know anything? Like, we all went and searched, and then we found out that it was in Africa. And I was like, wow. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm so excited. Some of Sola's alums, including Sajia and Fatima, were asked to come as well. So was the idea at that moment that you were escaping and that you weren't going to come back for a while? No. The idea was that the security is getting worse. We would live for a, for a you know, semester, and then if the security gets better, we would come back. If not, we would stay there for a year or more. But what was the atmosphere in Kabul at that point? The provinces were, you know, falling one after another, but then we were not hoping for Kabul to fall this soon. The U.S. government wasn't expecting Kabul to fall soon either. As American soldiers prepared for an announced end-of-August departure, Sola brought in passport officials on August 14th to process the girls' paperwork for flights a few days later. They worked into the night, but unbeknownst to all of them, it was too late. The Taliban were closing in and would enter Kabul in just a few hours. 
It was 5 a.m. in the morning when I um, got a knock on my door. One of my teacher came and said that you guys have to leave Sula in five minutes. And I said that, why? And she said, if the Taliban come, they will know that here is a school and they will kill all of us. All of the girls were shouting and all, all of us crying, what should we do? Taliban came to the Kabul and took all of Kabul. In the chaos of the Taliban takeover and government collapse, Sola quickly sent students home with teachers and staff. Shabana scrambled to transform what was to be an orderly departure into a sudden, life-threatening escape. But first, she had to keep a promise, one she'd made years earlier to a student's father. He said, promise me, um, when the Taliban come to Kabul, that you will burn my daughter's records if they find out that she's a student here, and they will kill me and my family. So Shabana did something heartbreaking, set fire in the school's furnace and courtyard to the hard-earned records of all of Sola's students. It was incredibly painful. It felt like making them disappear. The girls of Sola, their escape from Kabul, and how they're doing today when we come back. Most of us remember the desperate, frantic crowds trying to get out of Kabul after the Taliban takeover in August 2021. Among them were the students, teachers, staff, and staff families of Sola, 256 people in all. Sola's founder, Shabana Basish Rasuk, managed to get all of them on U.S.-approved lists to leave the country. But getting them into the airport was another matter altogether. There were a series of Taliban checkpoints, so arriving together as a girls' school was out of the question. Sola divided the students into groups, with many posing as the children of staff members. The call went out for all the groups to head to the airport on the morning of August 17th. The previous day had been chaos. People had been clinging to airplanes, and crowds had descended on the airport. Sisters Fatima, Sajia, and Aideen prepared to go there together. We had our masks. Uh, we made sure our uh, scarves are put tightly, and we were wearing very long dresses. When we left, my mom was telling us that make sure that you don't do eye contacts with, with Talibs. So we were just really scared, and then it was just like... If I look down, yeah. they won't look at me. Yes. Yeah. By the time we got closer to the airport, it was so crowded. The weather is hot and I have this black scarf and black mask and, and it's suffocating. People was pushing each other and shouting and all of the babies crying. I saw Taliban that they were um, they were shooting the guns and also the... They were shooting guns? Like the, the bullets. The sky. Someone took my scarf. It was in my head, and then someone, and the Talib saw me, and I shouted, and I said that they will kill me now. As a teacher quickly handed Najia a scarf, Fatima and her sisters were being jostled by the crowd. Everybody was pushing, and in a moment, I noticed that my sisters are in there. At one point, she was gone. So now it's just the two of you. I remember sitting there and then crying, and I was like, I didn't, I don't want to go. Can we just stop here, you know? Let's just go back. Honestly, I understand. I, I probably would have done just what you did. It was a tragedy, you know, with women having like their very young kids. I was like, I just can't take this anymore. I really didn't know what to do because she was not listening to me. And then one of Sula teachers came and told her that you got to stand up, go or stay here forever. And then uh, I took her hand and then we went. The three sisters were among more than 100 Sola students and staff, including Shabana, who made it into the U.S. military-controlled airport to safety that day and were processed to leave on waiting jets. 
Shabana was told her name was on a Taliban hit list, so she should get out right away with them. But all the other students and teachers were still stuck in the crowds outside. Shabana refused to go. I knew if I, if I left, it was game over. Those who were stuck at different checkpoints had no way of getting through. People were pushing us, and there were... One of them was Zara. Taliban uh, was saying sit, and there was no place to sit. Zara's group and others had to turn back, while Shabana spent a first sleepless night inside the airport. After two more days of waiting in these throngs, one last group of 52 was still stuck. Shabana asked a U.S. Marine captain to accompany her out of the safety of the airport and back to the Taliban checkpoint. Captain Nicholas Gray grabbed two members of his team and said, let's do this. You were in the airport and went out? And then went back. This is what you do. You have 10-year-old girls, 11-year-old girls, 15-year-old girls stuck on the other side. You do anything you can uh, to get them to safety. And she shouted, Sraya, Sraya, can this way? And I pushed, I pushed, I pushed, and I get her hand. And, and uh, she pulled you? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. These pictures were taken as the very last group of students and Shabana, after three days and two nights in that airport, boarded the military transport plane that would at last fly them away. She had managed to get everyone out, 256 people. You have to say to yourself, I did it, it's over. I got everybody out. It was finally having a moment to think about Oh, my God, this is it. Oh, oh, my God, this is it. So now you're looking to the future. We're leaving, you know, and I was taking with me from Afghanistan some of the best educated girls, women leaders in the making. I felt so heartbroken for our people, for Afghanistan. I felt heartbroken for the very people who are leaving. They are some of the most wanted talent in Afghanistan. And as soon as they step outside of this airport, they're going to be seen as unwanted refugees wherever they end up. Hello. Good morning. But her students are having a completely different experience. In Rwanda, they have been welcomed. Good morning. How are you today? We found them dressed in new school uniforms, since each of them had fled with just a backpack. I love what you're wearing. Thank you. They're hand-sewn with Rwandan patterns to honor their adopted home. Do you like it here? Yes. You wouldn't know they'd been away from their families for more than a year. Thank you. Sola's temporary campus here feels like a haven. It's a former hotel complex. Its restaurant now a dining hall, with classrooms converted from hotel suites. They're getting on with the business of learning, mastering math terms in English. With many of their Afghan teachers now resettled as refugees in other countries, Sola has brought in new teachers from abroad. That's great. Good job. This is a school for leadership. Yeah. You think that you'll become leaders? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be a surgeon. I want to help poor people in Afghanistan. I want to be a politician woman. A politician? Yeah. Soraya wants to be an astronaut. A space woman. And finally, from Zara. I want to be a spy. A spy? Yeah. <laughs> that came out of nowhere. <laughs> How are the girls doing? Our students, our girls have been consistently and remarkably focused. It is beyond inspiring to see these young girls who know. They have no idea when they are going to be able to reunite with their families. <laughs> But though they're more than 3,000 miles away, one by one, please. it is the 21st century. One of the most striking scenes we saw here was the daily hour after classes end when girls can call their families. Watching them scattered around the room is to feel the tremendous separation. 
But Chabana also sees the closeness. Yesterday I was watching swimming practice. One of them said, I've been wanting to learn how to float for such a long time, and I can finally do it today. So and I asked her, I said, do you share these kinds of moments with your family? She said, I share every single thing with my family. Mm -hmm. And they are so happy for me. They tell me that they are happy because I am happy. What's the reception been like in Rwanda? Remarkable doesn't quite capture it. I've had this conversation with so many Rwandans saying, please don't forget, we were also once refugees. Here we are, back in Rwanda. You will go back home, but for the time being, welcome home to Rwanda. Why does that happen? Did I throw it? No. In no. Earth, uh, there is gravity. Watching these girls learn, Jupiter, Mars. We were struck by the realization that they're among the only Afghan middle and high school girls out of a country of 40 million who are getting a formal education. Title slide, picture title name. But knowing how fortunate they are has made hearing the news from Afghanistan that much more painful. Fatima's female co-workers at the Ministry of Finance have all been replaced. My female colleagues received phone calls saying that they should send one of their male family members to work instead of them. So, so wait a minute, they were being told to send male relatives to take their, jo their jobs? As long as they can uh, do the job, they should send them. A year ago March, the Taliban announced that girls' schools would reopen. Girls flocked in, only to be told hours later to go home and stay there. <laughs> All over social media were videos of these young girls crying. And then I was so mad on everybody for, for not doing anything. You mean the rest of the world? This bunch of men has taken the control of an entire country, and then they're doing whatever they want. Women have been ordered to cover themselves head to toe again. They're banned from public parks, and just months ago banned from universities as well history repeating itself. And if there's one member of the Sola community who understands what Afghan girls today are facing, it's Mariam, the school's longtime cleaning woman and now seamstress. She knows the power of an education because she never got one. The Taliban were in power at that time. I mean, the first time the Taliban were in power. I was not allowed to go to school. Girls could not study. Miriam, um, can you read or write? I would really like to, but I can't. If I could have gone to school, I would have been very happy. It was very hard for me. But there is something that makes her happy these days, watching her ninth grade daughter, Zarmina, who is now a student at Sola. Talking about Zarmina's future, we finally saw Mariam smile. Are you proud of your daughter? Yes, yes, yes. We cannot, under any circumstances, submit to Taliban's vision for Afghanistan. And what does that mean for us? It means continue to educate more Afghan girls. But how? Well, she's recruiting them over Zoom from Afghan refugee communities and camps in countries around the world to bring them here to Rwanda. What should the U.S. government be doing, in your view? The one thing that the U.S. policymakers cannot, cannot afford to do is to forget about Afghanistan. Do not look away. Do not look away from Afghanistan. I cannot emphasize that enough. And what she wants them to see, alongside the ongoing tragedy in that country, is Sola's vision educated girls committed to one day being leaders of a different Afghanistan. We all, are we all are Afghans, they say. We love Afghanistan. We will try our best and work hard to improve our beautiful country. Improve our beautiful country. You say this every day. Yeah. yeah. We repeat it every day that it, uh, it's like in our heart. Do you all think you'll go back? Of, yeah. course. of course we will go. <laughs> Is it possible 
that you won't go back to Afghanistan. Is it possible? I spend every waking hour preparing for a return. It will happen. I've borrowed a stone from the airport. I need to return. Since our story first aired, Sola has continued to bring new Afghan students from around the world to Rwanda and is developing an online academy called Sola X. And in June, Shabana spoke to the UN Security Council, urging the world not to look away from the plight of Afghan girls. One atrocity in Vladimir Putin's unprovoked war in Ukraine is largely hidden, the torture of prisoners. We met three former POWs, survivors, in Kyiv, Ukraine's capital. They were soldiers and all women. What they say is extremely disturbing. Their stories can't be verified independently, but they track with the testimony that the UN collected from more than 150 former prisoners. At the end of a vicious battle, fear of Russian captivity was so great that one of the women we met simply looked to God and said, please, let me die. They fought here, in the southern port city of Mariupol. Once alive with 400,000 residents, Putin shelled Mariupol to misery. In April, the last Ukrainian troops were cornered in those steel mills above the graveyard. Tell me about the fight at the steel plant. 35-year-old Sergeant Irina Stoney is a medic. We saw people dying, children dying, children's heads being blown off, civilians. It's hard to bring those memories back. Hard, because at least 25,000 civilians were killed. She continued, We tried to help civilians. We tried to give them some assistance, at least something, water, medicine, food. There were little children with us. It's hard to watch your friend's head be blown off in front of you. It was, you can't describe this with words, difficult, very difficult, when people you know and children die for nothing. <sighs> Sergeant Stoney served in Mariupol with Captain Mariana Mamonova, a 31-year-old military doctor. She told us, there was one time when we saw a family running as we were driving to save our soldiers. And when we were coming back, the father was crying over his family, the bodies of the mom and a little child. Also at the steel mill, 33-year-old Sergeant Anastasia Chornenka ran communications. The fight there was desperate. Yes, constant aviation, artillery. This was non-stop fighting, non-stop shelling. During the battle, Chorninka often sent her family a text, just one character. She said, it was very quick. If you sent a plus sign, it meant you were alive. Dr. Mamonova also had a message. It should have been for her husband back home, but she would not send it. When did you realize that you were pregnant? I realized that I was pregnant in the middle of March. And when I saw that the test result was positive, I cried. I was hysterical. But she didn't want her husband to know how much he stood to lose. I knew if I died, it would be easier for him to reconcile with the loss of a wife than the loss of a wife and baby. By April, 
The fight for Mariupol was hopeless. Sergeant Stoney's unit was surrounded. They took away our men separately, splitting them up. Some of the men were beaten. Some of our men were... How shall I put it? Shot in the head. The Russians killed unarmed men. Yes, we were unarmed. About the same time, Captain Mamonova's unit was moving in the night to reinforce troops fighting for their lives. She told us, I would just say to my soldiers in my medical unit that if I was going to get captured, just shoot me. Don't look at me, just shoot me. And don't let me be captive. Don't let me. Suddenly, in our interview, she was back, hiding in the rear of a truck that ran into a Russian patrol. She turned to a fellow soldier. Please tell me that we did not get captured. And he's looking at me, not knowing what to say. I see fear in his eyes. I realize that he can't tell me that we didn't get captured because we did get captured. Next came a blinding light and voices warning that they would be shot. Artillery shells were falling down, and at that moment I was asking God to let me die. I thought, oh God, I don't want to be captured. I just want to die here. Please let me die. She knew that the walls of Putin's prisons muffle cries of torture. A UN POW investigation collected testimony of executions, starvation, attacks by dogs, twisting joints until they break, and mock executions. When they first talked about taking me for execution, Anastasia Chernenka told us, I only had enough time to pray and say goodbye to my children. Probably the worst you feel is that you won't see your children ever again. All her children knew was that the plus sign text stopped lighting up the phone. You don't know where the fighting is and whether your children are in a safe place. This is the most frightening thing for a mother. After Putin's unprovoked invasion, the UN POW report also found Russians abused by Ukraine, mostly during capture. But Ukraine has opened its POW camp to international inspection while Russia hides its penal colonies. Irena Stoney says that she was moved among four Russian prisons and tortured with electricity. They would rape some men. When we were in Tahanro prison, there was a cell for men and a cell for women, and we could hear our men screaming when they were being raped. They were making our men scrape off their tattoos. They were beating them badly. They did the same to women. They would beat them, pour boiling water on them. The only thing they didn't do, they didn't rape women. But the beating was brutal. Abuse was very bad. This is a Russian propaganda film in April that shows Mariana Mamanova in captivity. She's about four months pregnant and was told privately what would become of her baby. They said they would take my child away from me and they would move the baby repeatedly from one orphanage to another so I could never find my child. I wonder, as you felt your daughter moving. What did you tell her? I was saying to my child that we were strong and we could do it. Your mommy is strong. Your mommy is military. Your mommy is a doctor. Your mommy will save you. She asked only one thing from her child in return. You will be born in Ukraine. Can you hear me in there? 
You must be born in a free Ukraine, unknown to the prisoners. A free Ukraine was working to get them home. Andrei Yermak is chief of staff to President Volodymyr Zelensky. From the very first day, Yermak told us, President Zelensky set up the job to return prisoners of war. Leading negotiations for prisoner exchanges is Yermak's job. So far, his team has negotiated 38 POW swaps, trades of about equal numbers. 1,800 Ukrainians have been freed, an estimated 4,000 or so remain. What is your commitment to the POWs who are still being held by Russia? They should hold on and remember that your country will never forget you. We will do everything to get you released. Have strength and faith in our ability to return everyone home. There was fresh faith in his work in October with a deal to free 108 Ukrainians at once, all of them women. Irena Stoney was among them, hooded, tied, and told nothing. We had been transported in vehicles and by plane so many times before, and we thought they were just taking us to another cell. Anastasia Chorninka was also in the dark. She had duct tape over her eyes, so her first inkling was something she could feel. They put us on quite comfortable buses, which were never used. And we thought, something's not right, something's up, because the bus felt comfortable and soft. Later, the tape was cut from her eyes. And you realize that there is no guard behind you, and you stand there looking at the big sign that reads Ukraine. I understand that you got a new tattoo after you were released. May I see it? It reads, they were trying to kill me. They captured me, but I didn't give in because I was born Ukrainian. Another Ukrainian birth was delayed just enough. This is Dr. Mariana Mamanova walking to freedom. She told us near the end of her captivity, one kind Russian officer sent her to a hospital. And weeks later, she was in a prisoner exchange. How long was it from that moment of liberation until your daughter was born? Four days. I was liberated on the 21st of September, and my child was born on the 25th. A healthy girl named Anna. So she did exactly what you asked her to do, not be born until you were out of there. Yes, I was stroking my bump and I said, OK, we're home now, and you can be born. Everything is good. We are home. No one knows freedom like those who have lost it. The women we spoke to were held six months. Anastasia Chorninka retired from the military. Sergeant Irina Stoney is on duty near the front. And Captain Mariana Mamonova has maternity leave before she returns to the fight for Ukrainian freedom. And now, freedom's future. Imagine your teenage daughter was kidnapped while studying for her exams at school. And not just your daughter, but hundreds of girls in your town taken in the night. The families of Chibok, Nigeria, lived through that nightmare almost five years ago when the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram, whose name roughly translates to Western education is forbidden, attacked a local school and ran off with 276 girls. Some escaped, but it took the Nigerian government three years to negotiate the release of fewer than half of them. Since their release, the Chibok girls, as they're known, have been largely hidden from the public. But we were able to meet with them at a kind of prep school 
to hear the remarkable story of survival. This is a hostage video released by Boko Haram from their hideout in the Sambiza forest one month after the kidnapping. The Chibok girls are all covered, chanting verses from the Quran. They were facing a life of misery with beatings and starvation. But now, at the New Foundation School on the campus of the American University of Nigeria, the girls are singing again. This time, it's the Christian songs they grew up with. We are the Chibo girls that have been in captivity, and now we are alive. Getting out alive and singing hymns, things Rebecca feared might never happen. Did they let you sing when you were in captivity? No, we are singing in, priv in uh, private. private. They won't allow us to speak, to sing like that. So you had a whisper sing? Yes. <laughs> For Rebecca and her friends, just singing out loud today is a gift after their three years of living in fear and pressure to become Muslims. So if you didn't convert mm. to Islam, were you punished for not converting? Yes, they say if you didn't convert to Islam, you won't get home alive. That's what they say. Here are some of the girls two years ago, right after they were released, alive, but looking like concentration camp survivors, haunted and numb. This is Rebecca, skin and bones. I heard you were eating grass. Yeah, some of us eat that. And we are just be patient and live like that. No food, no anything. Else. Look at them today in their 20s. They're healthy and full of spirit at a school created just for them, paid for by the Nigerian government and some donors, where they are making up for lost time. They're from northern Nigeria, where life can be hard and opportunities for women are limited. Now, in their Wi-Fi equipped dorms, they have smartphones and laptops and their own beds. They go back to Chibok to see their parents twice a year, over Christmas and during the summer. What we call high blood pressure. Otherwise, they work hard here going to class six days a week, studying subjects like biology and math, working toward getting into the university, which would, for them, be free of charge. What's the hardest subject? Most of the girls we spoke to were shy and reticent as they told us that their tight bond going back to Chebok helped them survive. When Grace's leg was injured the night of the kidnapping, her sisters, as she calls them, Aisha and Mariam and others pulled her through. They are taking care of me. They are flushing water, clean. They are washing me, my clothes, and everything. We are worried about her leg. We don't have anybody there that will take care of her, only us. You helped each other, yeah. sick or unhappy or scared. You were a unit. Yes. They just had an unbelievable bond and an attachment to each other. Somiari Dem is the girl's therapist, on call 24-7. Born in Nigeria, raised and educated in the States, she has been with this group since they arrived over a year ago. Can you tell us what their experiences were like generally? Just a lot of the stuff, the starvation. They ate grass. Know, eating grass, exactly. Um, the beatings, um, you know, these things, you know, the forced, you know, f being forced to get married. At some point in time, you know, the bomb, the airstrikes. So these are some of the, you know, things that, you know, were reoccurring events. For three years? For three years, yeah. You were actually hit. The airstrike started as the Nigerian government pursued and attacked Boko Haram. A bomb dropped where you were being held. They mistakenly threw the bomb. And you were injured? With some particles. Shrapnel? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's still inside my body. It has not been removed. Because the shrapnel is in her liver. She is in pain, but she perseveres at school. 
Mm. You were kidnapped because you went to school. Mm. Now you're back in school. Do you feel like you're doing something courageous? Even what's happened with me will not stop me doing what I already designed in my mind. Reginald Braggs, an American, has also been at the new foundation school since its start. You're getting ready for midterm? Okay. A former naval officer turned college administrator, Braggs runs the school and designed the educational program. What is the biggest challenge for you in this program? You know, it really is trying to help the students to meet their goal of getting into the university. And part of that challenge is their English language proficiency. So I had this idea. I said, what do an old-fashioned American spelling bee with these guys? Orange. O-R-A-N-G-E. Correct. Sometimes one of them struggles over even an easy word, like poor. I know you. Poor. B. B U T. No. And is embarrassed. But when someone like Rebecca gets a hard word right. Assembly. A S S E M B L Y. Correct. A roar goes up. It's it's amazing how their confidence grows after this. You've seen a you've seen a progression. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, but do you think there's a lot of pressure on them in the spelling bee? Yes, of course. Uh, that's okay. Of course. Correct. This is about education for them and knowing that they can do something. And it's always better when you have someone who is confident and they're doing something, and the other students are observing them. If they can do it, you can do it. S C E P T. No. It's not as easy as having a can-do attitude for these girls, says Dem. She thinks they're being pushed too hard and that the curriculum is too rigorous. I think at times we need to kind of scale it back. Trauma really changes the brains, whether memory, co cognition, recall, retrieval. You, we, have to, we have to meet them where they are. If not, all we're doing is um, making the situation worse. We were told they still get flashbacks and night terrors. And it doesn't help that over 100 of their friends are still missing. Do you think about the ones who are still in captivity? When I think about them, I'm crying. And I know that place, I know the condition. I don't want my sisters to stay there. I want them to, to come out. Taking away any negative thoughts, Dem is using an array of therapeutic treatments to help them heal. Inhale. She leads them in yoga and relaxation exercises and provides individual and group therapy where most of the girls have had difficulty talking about the suffering they endured. Can you tell us just a little bit about what life was like in captivity? Mm. Is it too hard to talk about? Yeah, because I don't want to uh, remember some things. When I try, maybe I will feel like uh, crying like that. But her sisters share her memories. The idea here is that the trauma happened in a group, so it's good to do the healing in a group. If you have any pain in your body, this one Dem says she never pushes the girls to open up. So for instance, she doesn't know how many were raped. But she says there's a fine line between rape and forced marriage. You got married. Yes. Miriam wasn't forced to convert. She was already Muslim. So she was quickly married off to a Boko Haram commander and got pregnant. You gave birth there in the forest. Yes. She said the birth was difficult, but her son, Ali, was healthy. After two years, her Boko Haram husband actually helped her and Ali escape. Do you feel still that you're married? No. And Ali, now two and a half, where is he? He's in Chibok with his grandparents. The new foundation school decided babies wouldn't be allowed on campus. Would you like it if they let you have the baby here? Yes, I like it. But you know, it can't be possible to carry Ali here. What does he call you? Mariam. 
She's been separated from her son for so long, he doesn't recognize her as his mother. As a child of Boko Haram, Ali is likely to face difficult odds. But Mariam feels that with a good education, she can ease the way for him. We have two wards. The Nigerian government is paying for most of their schooling. But thousands of other women and girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram are languishing with other victims in government-run camps like this one we found just 30 minutes from the school. Okay. The contrast with the Chibok girls at the new foundation school is glaring. But their free education comes with the burden of great expectations. The school's walls are plastered with sayings like, there's no limit to what I can achieve. Their dorms are named after successful women like Michelle Obama and Malala. Do you feel that because you're getting this wonderful education free, that, that you need to give something back to your country? If I work hard and if I become something, it's not only this Nigeria, I will, I will help many countries. You'll be like Malala? Yes. Maybe I will do more than her. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about Don Deckel, president of the American University of Nigeria, says the new foundation school is grooming these young women to give back by becoming leaders. The best revenge is massive success. And I really think these young women are going to be some senators, some governors. Some of these young women want to join the military. They told me they want to be a general in the military and go get Boko Haram so they can't do this to any other young girls. It is ironic that their worst experience has led to opportunities beyond their wildest dreams. They're not completely healed, but every day they get stronger physically, mentally, emotionally, and Soldier. they spell better. S-O-N-D-I-E-R. Correct. Despite everything that they've been through, they push forward. So they come back, even with greater force, with greater determination, and they blow me away. 